So I, I suppose I, I want to begin by saying, you know, to the outside observer, you know, uh, looking in on something like this, uh, the, the conversation between uh, spirituality and psychology and grief, it, it might occur that they, they might not make the easiest of, of company because on the one hand, one group might find the other sort of more so interested in and obsessed with measurements and, and predictability and, and slave to the creation of facts. Uh, and for the other group, the critique could be that the, the absence of, of facts and, and the measurements leads to kind of airy fairiness and uh, there's far too much subjectivity and, and, so, uh, and kind of assumptions kind of being made on the basis of one subject, uh, subjective experience. And I think that's why I've got the, uh, the slide here um, which actually kind of nicely says the, the sort of the, the connection between the, the psychology bit and, and the spirituality. But what I could argue is, is that whilst psychology kind of talks about the architecture and structure of grief, um, the spirituality talks about the kind of the soul, the, the, the kind of almost the lived within the body experience of what it is like to be uh, bereft in that kind of thing. So in my view, such a dialogue can be extraordinarily fruitful um, because uh, each can potentially be enriched by what each of the disciplines kind of offer. Um, I've included the, the, the slide and the slide here to the right hand side. I'm going to bring up a slightly bigger one there. And it's, it's, um, it's a sculpture um, sculpted by the Hungarian sculptor um, Albert Grigori is his name and it's actually beside Lake Geneva in Switzerland and one of the critics of it said that of this is for anyone who has ever felt the loneliness of a hundred rooms or the weariness when you've lost a battle for anyone who is so bereft that they feel like an empty shell or those who found themselves dissolving over the loss of someone so precious. Grigori is speaking to you, for he knows exactly how that feels. And, and I think it's a really kind of compelling image that uh, it's, it speaks, you know, almost heart speaks unto heart. And it's, it's, it's a quite a compelling kind of image, I think. And likewise, um, Michelangelo's Pieta to the left-hand side of the image there, it was, it was done in 1498, um, about five years or so after Columbus discovered um, the, the Americas. And insofar as, as the mother of God, uh, together with her son, the kind of iconic, um, kind of uh, the iconography of mother and son um, expressing uh, maternal love, Michelangelo's Pietro expresses the anguish of the loss um, and the loss of that connection. And in fact, some of the kind of spiritual writings kind of come to mind in the sense of when it says that in the dust of death, you have laid me. So it is, it is something of these, these the, the, the spirituality can speak to the psychology and likewise the psychology can speak to the spirituality, which is what our, our, our presentation really is about this morning. So coming back to the next slide, um, uh, so when we think about spirituality, kind of, um, it's it's a really problematic uh, term to pin down and um, and sort of uh, to kind of you know formalize if you like. And despite the increasing use of the concept of spirituality uh, among researchers, it's there's a lot of contention about about what it actually means. In fact, if you were to go back 50 or 60 years ago, the idea of spirituality wouldn't really have been commonly known as in the vernacular as it, as it is known now. Uh, much more so then it would have been things like re religiosity and religion would have been the, the kind of common phraseology. But, but spirituality has become much more to the front right over the last kind of few decades or so. Um, and there is, as I say, a, a lack of standardized definition. But in my sort of uh, reading up regarding this, um, there has been uh, a, a number of people who have come up with sort of uh, definitions. And, and I would say that the most cited reference actually is, is of the following, that um, it's kind of from Hill and Pargament in 2003 in the States, 
spirituality is uh, understood as a search for the sacred, uh, a process through which people seek to discover, to hold on, and when necessary, transform whatever they hold sacred in their lives. And uh, among the books, which I kind of had a kind of brief thumb through, uh, the most cited reference is the one that comes from Kyoing et al. in 2001. And what they say, spirituality is the personal quest for understanding. Uh, the, the, the answers to ultimate questions about life, about meaning, and about relationship to the sacred or transcended, which may or may not lead to or arise from the development of re religious rituals and the formation of, of community. And that's kind of come from uh, showing back in 2001. I suppose a, a kind of an acronym, a, a very playful acronym we could use as well is what we call the GLUE acronym, which is the God, Life, Universe, and Everything. Uh, and, and, and so that's, that's what certainly how we can kind of proceed with a kind of a, a definition. So the distinction, but we want to say as well that there's a distinction between sort of uh, spirituality and religiosity, and that's kind of the, the spirituality has gained much more representation within the kind of the, the, the new age movement, if you like, and which brought the approach of spirituality away from religion. So you could almost kind of say there's this kind of seekers, which would have been kind of couched in spirituality and sort of dogmatists would have been kind of couched in really religiosity. But uh, one of the things that I came across was an overall view of, of spirituality, which was undertaken by uh, a researcher in South America in Brazil. And in 2001, she published a paper, which is actually free access. It's on psychological uh, frontiers, I think it's called. And uh, what she did was something very interesting. She sort of literally went through a lot of the research papers on spirituality and and made a systematic review of the of the of the kind of what a definition could be. And in, in her view, spirituality is a complex and multidimensional part of the human experience. Um, it has thinking elements, it has experiential elements, and it has uh, behavior elements. The, the sort of thinking or philosophical aspects include the search for meaning, for instance, uh, the search for purpose and truth in life, and the beliefs and values by which an individual lives. The experiential and emotional aspects involve feeling of hope and love, connection, <clears throat> which I'm, I'll speak of later on, um, inner peace, comfort and support. These are reflected um, in the quality of an individual's inner resources, the ability to give and receive spiritual love, and the types of relationships and connections that exist with the self, the community, the environment, uh, and the transcendent. And when I, when I speak of the transcendent, I'm, I'm, spo I'm speaking of a kind of a power greater than self, often kind of talked about within the AA movement, um, a, a value system, God or a, a cosmic consciousness. Um, the behavior aspect of spirituality involves the way a person externally manifests uh, these, uh, these sort of beliefs. Um, often through uh, prayer or meditation or uh, some ritual kind of activity. So you can see in the in the diagram here that they came up with a with a with a a layered uh, sort of uh, I suppose diagram which kind of uh, gives a framework uh, that proposes how these interacting elements um, interact together. And you can see being in the, in the middle, there's this idea of connection. And connection is really understood as a, a really good starting point for spirituality. It's the kind of uh, the, this, the, the sort of middle through which the other practices and beliefs kind of orientate themselves. So along the top, uh, the, 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 the first bit is, is to do with, with sort of our beliefs our, and practices 
and experiences of, of spirituality. And then the, the second the second bit, which is the, the, the kind of darker gray bit, and it refers to things like uh, the, the sacred. And the sacred is something that can't be described in ordinary terms or conventional terms. It's considered sacred through manifestation, a revelation to the individual or, or his religious or spiritual group, such as an object or a symbol that reveals something unique, uh, something of a unique nature to that person who contemplates it. So it can be something entirely, entirely individual. The life and death idea relates to the, the immaterial and immortal uh, uh, positions present in the individual that survive in another realm after bodily death. So we're talking about those the kind of life, uh, people being present or being in some way in existence beyond, beyond death. And uh, this is this is a, a kind of a classic belief within things like Buddhism or, or sort of Christianity or Judaism or in Hinduism as well. And there's the idea of spiritual beings related to the contact or influence of immaterial beings, and, and this goes back a long way. So that even even our forefathers, in terms of our ancestors, our ancestors believed in terms of making connections with our with with our lineages, if you like. And then there's the divine, uh, often gone, refers to the belief of one, one or more gods uh, being of ultimate power connected to the celestial world and, and, the, and the kind of transcendent, if you like. And there's also a spirituality concerned with self, really. Um, and this relates to the connection with oneself, one's body, and the individual's inner resources. We speak of our spirit being strong or our spirit being kind of low. So that's that's a, an element of spirituality as well. It's something that it lives ironically within oneself, but also is orientated to the outside and, and the transcendent. And then there's the community aspect of spirituality and aspects related to the feel significant connection with other persons in the community, our neighbors, our families and friends. And this kind of connection could be, could be understood as the, the social factor of spirituality. And then there's the nature, <clears throat> the nature, and, and maybe perhaps in the, in the next uh, uh, brief talk next month on the, on the 9th, perhaps more of this will be talked about. And it's understood as the, as, as, as nature communicating aspects of the sacred. When we look at things like, you know, the changing of the seasons or uh, wonderful sunrises or sunsets, um, you, can, you, can all, you can almost feel as it's almost like an epiphany of some kind. And we, we could regard these as things like eco-spirituality as a, as a way that's kind of nested and grounded in, um, in, in the nature and the created world. And lastly, art. And art kind of contemplates development of artwork, painting and, and sculpture, music, uh, literature. And, and I referred earlier on, you recall, to the two sculptures, the, the two sculptures being sort of embodied of that. They both are spiritual in their presentation and spiritual in terms of their connection potentially with, with, with people. I'm, I kind of often think about uh, Samuel Barber's music and some of the most haunting but beautiful music um, kind of ever written. And it can put us in touch with something quite, quite deep within ourselves. So the third axis on the bottom there, it refers to um, you know, the well-being, uh, personal development, the development of values. And, and, a, and these are called the, the spiritual well-being aspects. So it's that there's certainly the kind of the dimensions of spirituality one can think about it. So um, move on to the next one. So in terms of kind of findings, when we think about the relationship between uh, between sort of um, spirituality and, and grief, well, what are what are the findings that that, that has been found? So um, France et al. interviewed three hundred and twelve adults. Uh, approximately one year after the loss of a loved person. And 42% of the subjects stated that their religious beliefs had been very helpful. 
Um, and these consisted of belief that the loved person is at peace uh, and traditional aspects of religions that were a source of strength, which has kind of prayer and faith in God. Um, belief in the afterlife was a big help. And for 23% of the subjects interviewed, religion was not helpful because they did not have a religious belief or they lost it. Um, and one third of subjects had no customs that helped them cope with grief. And, but overall, there was no significant relationship between religious and coping. But subjects who found their beliefs very helpful were significantly more optimistic about the future. So in another study, um, 42 adolescents um, were, were studied after the death of a sibling. And, and they found that uh, before the death, religion had not been an important uh, for nearly half the participants. But at the time of the interview, 62% said that religion had become more important or very important to them. And uh, the value of religion had become uh, really important in terms of, of how they were managing. And uh, another study, well, two other studies found by Bohannon and Esterling and found that regular church attendance or spiritual experience was related to better grief adjustments. Um, so next one. And, and there, was, there was a relationship, with, uh, so Walsh and, and, and the other uh, researchers there, they examined the relationship between spiritual beliefs and bereavement outcome. And in a sample of 135 relatives and friends of dying patients, and they were recruited from a palliative care center in London. And, and this particular study was actually ranked as being high, of high methodological quality. They reported a strong, although not significant, statistically significant, positive effect of religious and spiritual beliefs on coping with bereavement. And people with low strength of belief resolved their grief more slowly during the first nine months, but by 14 months had caught up with people with strong religious belief. Um, and in this study, the authors supposed that the strength of spiritual beliefs may play a role in the timing and quality of the resolution of grief following the death of a loved person. Loved person. So when we think about th those findings, and they all seem to be saying roughly the idea that spirituality can actually really help with, with, with them, uh, with, with the, the transition out of grief, well, not even the transition, but coping with grief, I'll put it like that. Um, what is it within spiritual beliefs and spiritual practices that actually matter? Well, well this is kind of, this is where kind of the, the sort of really matters um, in the sense that um, Pargament, who's probably the most prolific author in terms of um, researching this area, he, in some, what he believes, it's actually what you do as in terms of a practice integrated with what you believe what matters most. So it seems to be the idea of of cohesion, it seems to be this idea of the two interacting together that makes the most difference. But it needs to be nested in in a particular um, in particular kind of uh, elements of spiritual belief, and those elements are listed here. That it has to be well integrated, flexible, differentiated, and benevolent. So when we think about these things well integrated, it, our spirituality is to be helpful and productive in terms of uh, coping with grief. It, 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 the, what I mean by a spiritual integrated is the extent to which uh, spiritual beliefs and practices are organized into a coherent whole. And, the, and there's an ongoing integration uh, and of ideas, of values, and beliefs. It's not static. It's an ongoing, um, ongoing, developing, uh, flourishing thing. It's a living thing. It's not just kind of rigid. And that takes us to the second thing: that it's flexible. That our spiritualities, in order to be helpful, have to be have to be flexible. They have to be 
the ability to be able to change spiritual beliefs and behaviors and attitudes and and can be able to cope with with sort of on sometimes uh, difficult answers and and unanswerable questions at times um differentiation spiritual differentiation refers to being able to tolerate complexity and avoiding of oversimplification being open to new ideas and information and being able to uh, uh, adapt that um that, that new those new ideas into our ongoing uh, spiritual beliefs and practices and and lastly i think the, the, the kind of benevolence idea and it's the, that's the, the degree to which god is viewed as being benevolent and uh, being kind and being interested and being sort of uh, aware of one's suffering so those are the kinds of elements that are actually that, that that's the kind of take home message that I would want to say is that it's what we do when when the kind of dust settles and and the fragments of our life are sort of uh, in front of us because of a, a grief uh, situation. It's the kind of practices that we've developed over time that really will hold us together, and and they are those practices are nested within a spirituality which is well integrated. It's flexible, it's able to adapt, it's uh, differentiated, it can integrate new inf information, and it's based on an idea of the transcendent, which is positive, which is kind and comforting, and particularly uh, compassionate. So rather than kind of get into what kinds of spiritual spirituality might do better than others, I want to avoid that question completely, be it sort of Buddhism or uh, eco-spirituality or just Christianity that's a secondary question that's a secondary idea it's the idea the, the main kind of take home message is that um, it's the practices that would sustain you uh, that seem to be uh, the finding of of sort of um, that what, that's what seems to make the difference and those practices are nested in a spirituality whatever that might be and whatever you would find uh, life-giving, which would be well-integrated, flexible, differentiated, 